The first speaker is James Pike, and he is talking on three principles of enhanced learning environments. Correct? Yeah. Three <laughs> principles of enhanced learning environments. And um, James um, is a wonderful human being, that's all I can say. He uh, graduated from USC School of Cinematic Arts in 2002. In 2003, he joined um, the Institute for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention Research, and he supervised um, the logistics for a very large um, NIDA-funded transdisciplinary prevention research center. Um, um, during that time, he also, pre oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, he, during that time, he also produced um, a variety of multimedia works um, on topics um, such as fast food consumption in urban China, um, community-based disaster recovery in rural India, and multicultural teen smoking habits in the United States. And in 2008, um, he formed his own um, company, Cut and Spliced Productions, um, with the intent of providing multimedia and management services to institutions and organizations that strive to better humanity um, through public health education and research. In 2010, he joined us at the School of Community and Global Health as the center manager for um, the technology-based obesity study funded by National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the National Cancer Institute. Um, and he also serves as a multimedia instructor for several new courses on international public health issues. So welcome, James Pike. Okay, so it's, it's getting later in the day, so we'll try and make this quick and fun. Um, so our talk today, three principles of enhanced learning environments. Now when we're talking about enhanced learning environments, what we're talking about is environments in which existing technologies are used in new and innovative ways to enhance the educational experience. Now, a lot of times when I'm talking to a group of people and I'm telling them that we're going to use a new technology or we're going to take an existing technology and use it in a new way, the reaction I get is often like this. Um, <laughs> it's because we are creatures of habit. We get attached to our technology. We treat them just like people. And so a lot of my job is not so much getting new technologies to work. I actually think that's the easy part of it. The harder part is guiding people through what I call the Hoover Ross five stages of technology acceptance. <laughs> Looks something like this. Uh, I won't belabor the point, but the concept here is that at the end of the day, these technologies are just tools. There is a final stage. We can get excited about what we're doing. Despite the wisdom that you can't teach old drugs new tricks, you can, especially when it comes to technology. It just means you have to apply the right principles in how you're using it. So what does that mean? Well, uh, to talk about what that means, I want to give you a specific case study, which is a recent class that we did, uh, just completed up um, actually yesterday. And uh, um, what was interesting about this class is that everyone in the class, teachers and students, accelerated through those various stages very, very quickly. Um, now, unfortunately, there's a lot of reasons for that that you can't always duplicate in every class. Um, we had a great business partner. Cisco Systems gave us some wonderful, very user-friendly tools that got everyone excited about what was, what was possible in this enhanced learning environment. Um, we had a great teacher. Dr. Palmer was really willing to integrate these new tools, make them part of the education experience. And most importantly, we had great students who were really willing to jump in and see how these new tools worked and see what they were capable of. So fortunately, you can't always duplicate that, but you can duplicate some of the principles we applied and how those things are used. Before I get to that, let me just give you a quick overview of some of the tools that we used and what the transition process looked like for the students and the teachers, what their initial reactions were and what it was by the end. Thank you. 
that's just 14 students. So, um, now, when it comes to enhanced learning environment, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that there aren't that many hard rules. There are lots of different roads to success. Uh, there's also lots of many different roads to failure. So we're talking about some of the great guiding principles that we use so that uh, if anyone else decides to go this route and start using these environments, you can hopefully have a path to success. First principle, examine your cultural legacy. This concept comes from Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. In that book, he talks about how there were certain countries that had airlines with above average crash rates. One of the things that was a contributing factor was the fact that in these cultures, there was a history of having a great deal of respect for authority figures. That created a problem in the cockpit. When the pilot would make a mistake, it was the job of the co-pilot to mention that mistake. They wouldn't, and those mistakes would build up to the point where a crash was inevitable. So in order to achieve their goal of better airline safety, they had to look at their cultural legacy and address it. Now, what does that mean for higher education? Traditionally speaking, this is our cultural legacy, a system in which the teacher provides information to students who are passive receivers. New model looks a lot more like this, where the students and the teachers interact both inside and outside the classroom, and they're learning as much from each other as from the teachers. Now, practically, what does that mean in a classroom? It means that when you're designing, say, an online Web 2.0 system where the teachers and the students are acting, you can't just go to the teacher. You have to go to the students, too, and allow them to design what that interface looks like, because they're going to be using it just as much, if not more, and learning from each other just as much of that more as they are from the teacher. So it has to be kind of a more collective experience. Second principle, look at what works. Now this comes from Jerry Sternen, who was given a very difficult task. He was working with a nonprofit in Vietnam, and they said, you have six months to improve malnutrition in rural villages in uh, Vietnam. And he realized that given that time frame, he couldn't really do a lot to bring resources that were missing to those areas. So instead, what he did is he looked at families in these rural villages that were particularly healthy, even though they had the same access to resources. So if they had a certain balance between meat and vegetables, if they had a certain way of getting access to clean water, they figured out what that was, they'd see what worked, and they applied it to the rest of the families inside the village. And in some of those villages, malnutrition dropped by as much as 85%. So higher education, what that means is one of the common complaints I hear is that students are getting all their information online. Well, that's okay. It's just a place to get resources. What they need is some guidance and structure on the best way to use those resources and apply them in a classroom setting. So what Dr. Palmer did, which was very clever, was she encouraged the students to interact on forums, but she gave them some instruction and some guidance and some examples of how you could do it. And so instead of just quick little blips saying, yeah, I like this, or that was cool, or whatever, our students were providing detailed explanations, pulling in concepts from the class, using citations from peer-reviewed scientific articles, and then even including those articles inside, so inside the actual environment so that people could access it and learn from it as well. Third principle, permit ambition. And this story comes from Ken Robinson, senior advisor for the Getty Trust, very interested in education. And one of the things that he talks about is how a lot of times we will uh, we'll prohibit, our students, or prohibit our students from going after what they want. Um, he talks about a classroom where there was a group of students and a teacher, and there was one student in particular who was always a little reticent, didn't always get involved, until one day the teacher said, well, we have a little bit of extra time. Why don't you go ahead and just draw something? The student got very excited, started drawing something. The teacher came over and asked, what are you drawing? The student said, I'm drawing a picture of God. <laughs> the teacher said, well, no one knows what, job, what God looks like. And the student said, well, they will in a second. <laughs> so the concept, of course, is that when our students come with their grand ambitions, as opposed to giving them something simple that we know they can pull off and limiting them and just having them do that one thing where um, they might learn a little bit from pulling off something easy, let them go after the grand ambition. Now, in our classroom, what happened, there was a handful of students who came and said, for our final presentation, we want to have 20, 30 minutes of video. These are people who had never really used a camera before, who didn't have any prior edit experience, and my, my initial reaction was, not possible. But instead of disciplining them, I disciplined myself and said, great, go after it. Here's some tools, here's some helpful tips, and they pulled it off. And so the concept here, of course, is that if they make mistakes in pursuit of this grand ambition, they will learn a lot more than if it was something simple that we knew they could achieve anyway. And there's always a chance they can pull it off. Now, what does this all have to do with public health? Um, as you've been hearing a lot today, diseases of the past, infectious diseases, that was 20th century challenge. 21st century challenge 
diseases, chronic non-communicable diseases. And one of our best tools for dealing with that is education. So the very principles that we're learning in higher education can be used to, yes, train the next public health professionals, train the next leaders in the field, but also to create cost-effective, scalable, technology-based interventions that can be used to provide innovative evidence-based programs straight to the people who need them. Now, Wei actually presented on this, so I'll just give you the quick 90-second highlight of what that means. In the late 1990s, the Pacific Rim Transdisciplinary Tobacco and Alcohol Use Research Center conducted a large public health study in several cities throughout China. In 2004, the PRT-TARC partnered with the Chengdu Center for Disease Control to convert the findings from that study into a smoking education program. This program was designed to reach the large number of youths in China who smoke. The goal of the program was to convert this into this, an educational model at which students collaborated with and learned from each other. In the first version of the program, students were put into groups and asked to create posters that warned other students about the dangers of smoking. After this version of the program was successfully implemented, a new goal was set, to convert this into this an educational model in which students and teachers interacted both inside and outside the classroom. To do this, teachers and students were given cell phones. Using the phones, they were able to send different forms of media to each other. Together, they created and shared a variety of digital messages about the impact of smoking. So, what's great about all the stuff we've been talking about today is this came out of one class. Um, over the summer and fall semester, we'll be doing at least three classes that have these enhanced learning environment principles and a lot of technologies, new technologies, are integrated from as well. So stay tuned, more will come. Um, and that's it. Thanks for listening.